I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today I continue with Section 4-5 of The Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. The Theology of the Sun Synopsis The mass energy universe is a knot, which unravels in space and time at the direction of life. In no way can life do without the energizing of the physical universe. The consumption of matter into spirit is just that, a consumption, and by it, a transfiguration. If one considers that the primeval earth was not much more than molten rock, one can vaguely gauge the miracle of the life spirit and the massiveness of its ecological transmutability. Life itself is a transformer made of mass energy particles, extruding spirit from stone, From molten rock to the present is indeed in all the way a theological journey, in its minuteness and strangeness not less than in the spatial temporal enormity. If reality is focused on this transformation of mass energy into spirit, then the dynamics of ecology are theological. Ecology is theology, theoecology. In other words, if there is any substance to the assertion that life is the slow evolution of matter into spirit, the making of an imminent God worthy of as much reverence, if not more, as the historical God, then it is difficult to separate ecology from theology. It is common wisdom to say that we are all children of God. What if it were truer to say that an infant God is moving toward adulthood through the actions of all of us, provided that life continues to evolve? Then the long journey of divinity into adulthood is neither a return to something old and lost, nor a commute between two specific stations. Rather, it is a journey into the unknown. It is primarily the uninterpreted technological feat of impregnation of matter with the radiance of spirit achieved and augmented by the economics of life in the ultimate sense of the term economy in all of its manifestations. The possible journey into the adulthood of divinity, the lengthy evolutionary venture, feeds upon the physical universe, the quasi-inexhaustible repository of raw materials and energy needed for the task of creating the most glorious of all conceivable gods. If this seems to echo the gross national product ethos, one might consider that, one, the Western ethos cannot accept the theology of God who expects man's repentance in exchange for the promise of his return to his arm or womb. That is, as we all see, the advocacy of a steady-state ecology, and we must be aware that the idea of steady-state contradicts the most telling characteristics of Western civilization. Self-reliance, drive, pioneering, perseverance, and the underlying Faustian inquietude. Two, there is also the ever-present risk of being caught in idolatry. Our dominant idols may well become greed, intolerance, mediocrity, etc. Since the thesis is that we become co-responsible for making the new divinity, the Omega God, failure to create the right God builds failure into our entire future. The birth and becoming of a true God is the measure of reality. And this is as yet a hypothesis, because only the conceiving stage of the process can be postulate. If the making of the Omega God, as distinct from the assumed Gamma God of traditional theology, is the thesis of the living in the process of becoming, then we must recognize within this long development an iron logic, regulating the process of experimentation, which is inherent in the journey called evolution. Each experiment which does not conclusively support such a logic bears the seal of failure. Before considering such a logic, let us look at one attempt in the direction which has gone astray. One can say generally that the door slamming behind each experiment, not conclusively supporting such logic, is the determinism into which the experiment falls. This seal can be the death sentence for a species or the caging of it in a self-made prison of determinism, the insect world, for instance. The fate of the insect tells us that the technological instrumentation which carries out the extrusion of the spirit from matter, the invention of life in its numberless forms, is a double-edged sword. One edge opens windows on landscapes in interiority, the other cuts the jugular through which flows the sap of metamorphosis, physical, as well as metaphysical. The armored insect is physiologically deprived of access to consciousness, one of the possible conquests of such metamorphosis. Technology developed by man, an offspring of biotechnology, can imprison human development in a cage as deterministic as the one that imprisoned the arthropoids. The tragic, joyful music of life 
becomes then a naked confrontation with fate. The magnificence of the biotechnical machine containing the whole hordes of crabs and beetles yields a muted cry for an unachievable god. The ultimate consequence of disconnecting ecology from theology is to risk the fate of the crab, a grand fate as far as crabs go, but pure despair for humankind. For the human mind, to separate ecology from theology is to move blindfolded on a landscape covered with booby traps. The health of ecological habitats and any meaningful future for mankind and evolution at large can only be realized if ecology and theology are seen as aspects of the other. Because evolution from brimstone to consciousness spirit has been a lengthy process, eventful and immensely costly in sufferance, the continuation of this process has to be assured for the sake of the legacy of a meaningful future. This is the same future the evolutionary phenomenon has begun to outline forcefully and convincingly as the attempt towards the making of godliness. The guiding logic is therefore the paradoxical hypothetical lighthouse set at the end of time, not because as yet undiscovered by man, but because as yet uncreated by life. The simulation of such a possible reality, a skeletal structure at first, is a challenge and a responsibility which we must face, for if we do not, we retreat into naught. Going by the theology of the day, things look dim, if not grim. We are not at all ready to carry on responsibly, but are more like a protean beast, self-punishing and revolting against the self-inflicted pain. The evolutionary process seems to say that part of its strategy is to come up with new forms, mutations, which now and then generate new and useful activities, functions. Forms predispose elements for new contents, form before function. Now... Since the totality of the living process is not a linear event, but rather a frontal tide of feedback loops, the only access to the future which is not purely an illusory reprint of the past is in the constant appearance of new forms, the loops being capable of eliciting new contents. And there is a column here. Evolutionary th thrust towards the spirit. Primary loop, secondary loop. The primary or creation loops are forms which define function and are woven perpendicularly to the direction of themselves and all along the thrusts of such direction by the secondary loops of the menutentive aspects of reality whose genesis and development is an inversion of the primary loops genesis and development. The secondary loops, the sum of which can be identified as the routine of life, form a support to all those actions and activities which sustain the development of the present. These minor loops, the maintenance and continuity crowds with their fantastic machines, us most of the time, are forced to transcend themselves by transforming routine into ritual through grace and reverence. These rituals are offerings, if one chooses, to the existential imminent fragmentary helpless omega god, ritual offerings otherwise expressed as the reverence for life. Illustrating the significance of the metaphor of the loops are two main cases. Case A, the creation loops prevail, one of two things happens. If the cosmos is saturated with spirit, that is to say, the Omega God is incipient, then the routine supported by the maintenance loops accordingly dwindles away because it be is becoming less and less necessary. If the cosmos is far from being close to the radiance of the Omega God, the disappearance of maintenance loops spells the breakdown of the evolutionary machinery. Case B. The maintenance loops prevail. One of two things happens. 3. For the cosmos well on its way towards the Omega God, there is a catastrophe of loss of creative power, the derailment and a stagnation. 4. For the cosmos in proximity to the Alpha God, there is quiescence with success of a sort which is trapped precluding further development. Of these, one, it is possibility only in the most distant of futures when the metamorphosis of matter into spirit is quasi-total. 2. Might well have some prevalence in the Eastern commitment which prematurely discredits the importance of instrumentalizing the spirit with adequate physical machinery, psychosomatic man included. 3. It is the case of the Western mind confounded by the exhilaration of physical technological prowess, marring the most intimate and intangible domains of the spirit. 4. It is the case of fossil species, anthropod, insects, etc., whose survival success story is the triumph of automatism over routine grace and creative power. One can imagine a human condition where the withering of the creative loops to the advantage of the maintenance loops might produce a kind of reality in apparent agreement with static non-theological structure. This is comparable to the self-balancing countenance of an ecological fragment composed of the mineral support, climate, bacterial, vegetal, insect, and animal life for which the future is in too many ways the reenactment of the past. Steady state ecology is the advocacy of such equilibrium, a relative staticity, since the larger... Re 
potentiality of which it is a part is involved in the constant and irreversible reordering of things from which emerges new challenges whose pressures will transform more or less beyond recognition all the component parts. This is the totality of the evolutionary phantasmagoria. The creation and maintenance loops woven together make for the pre-future the transparent the emergence of the spirit. The well-balanced strength of the primary creation loops and the secondary maintenance loops weaving the continuity and resilience of the primary loops is the optimistic condition for the emergence of reality, of new futures, and of the power of the imminent God, the simulation, extrapolation of which, by religious doctrines, fathoms a final omega God. Imagining for a moment the evolutionary swell to be completed and calling for such an image a simulation of its eventual concreteness, this simulation is what we call religion. The prophets, saints, and martyrs of religion are its living and suffering manifestation, the instantaneous revelation of its sacredness. The cool head that science has had to keep is quite necessary since the secondary maintenance loops are the bulk of life reality. But the substance of such reality is progressive complexity originating from the primary loops, which science, as the discovering discipline, is entitled to acknowledge. A posteriori, as a posteriori, as past events, whose logic and rationale are in continuous metamorphosis, and the development of which is not the province of science, but the province of technology and of the spirit. This technology of the spirit emerges into reality once the level of consciousness has been reached by the technology of the flesh, the vegetal, and the animal kingdoms. The central importance of theology is revealed by the presence or absence of the transrational in the man-made world, since it is the transrational that the spirit dwells. A strictly rational environment, the technocratic city, for instance, is a reality in which the primary loops have shriveled to nothing and the secondary loops of maintenance continuity have become a linear but blind diagram, which fails to support the creative primary loops and also fails in what it is its own prerogative, the, the continuum of routine grace. Strict rationalization is mandatory squalor, the 1984 dead-end situation. But then, where is the rationale for a transrational phenomenon? It can only be found, as is to be expected, in the one transrational reality we know, life as suspect as yet within the cosmic reality. Here is where the iron logic of evolutionary success comes into the picture. Certainly, the success is not to be explained by reductionist theories in which life is purely mechanistic, deterministic, rational phenomenology. Out of the monumental transformism of evolution and its confounding complexity, one, only one thing seems to emerge clearly and constantly that such complexity is the due section machina of the degree of its transformism and the pressure of its intensity. It is not difficult to see why. Life is a measured and formed response to the challenges of the inner and outer realities, whatever those might be, since, at least theoretically, the degree of understanding of the challenges defines the fitness and impact of the response. Fitness and growth are directly dependent on the quantity and quality of information appropriated and digested by the organism. From this comes the privileged position of the complex as the most knowing and responsive, the most spirited, and ultimately the sacramental. Complexity and intensity are the spatial and durational parameters of consciousness, the stuff painstakingly generated from the primeval alpha god, the sun. But the spatial, durational, the complex, the living have for Enplecki the utterly centered character of the Omega God, the God point of total spiritualization, maximum complexity, maximum consciousness, knowledge, creation, and therefore, not surprisingly, the mandatory physical parameter of miniaturization. This element of miniaturization that could have been detected all along the evolutionary phenomenon seems to fit to perfection even the greatest of all extrapolations, the Omega God. This is more done with less, not in the simplistic ethos of simplification disintegration, but in the demonism of spiritualization etherealization. To put it another way, since the genesis of the spirit is the sensitization of matter, the methodology of the process of matter becoming spirit must be in agreement with the modes which life has been defining and testing and successfully fostering such genesis. They are interiorization, complexification, and centration convergence. For all of them, the physical miniaturization of the spatial structure is characteristic and mandatory. Do the same thing with less, because by doing so, such same thing becomes better than itself and is more able to plug itself into other similar to similar things. From this arises the access to a new round of information, knowledge, sensitization, more matter becoming radiant with more spirit, and the consolidation of the bridge between matter and spirit. The bridge between the Alpha God of the Sun and the Omega God of the Spirit is the lengthy purgatory of matter transfiguring itself into fragments of God under the pressures of complexification, intensification, understanding, sensitization, and miniaturization. Thus, the inescapable nature of the theological path on the methodological guidelines of the transrational destiny of life. 
What is fueling the crucible that can concert matter into surmatter, that can initiate and foster the chain of evolution? There is a single power source in terrestrial universe tentatively elected by various theologies as a divine body whose acting presence is indispensable to the development of what I have called the theological ecology, theoecology. It is the sun. To view this immense furnace purely as a center of brood energy is correct enough. To dismiss it as a divine body, primeval as one pleases, might reveal a misplacement of values. As far as we can conjecture and rationalize, the god of the origin is pure, brute, mass or energy, an unlimited savagery, predetermined and deterministic, the single reality most authentically antithetic to what we now apprehend as spirit. For us earthlings, such a powerhouse is the sun, and none other than the sun. From such negation of the spirit, the fate of which per se is to step down the length of the entropic ladder, comes the origin and development of life whose destiny is the stepping up the length of evolution toward the Omega God. In the cosmic context, the fury of the suns isolated from each other by the knot of intergalactic space is the rule, while the yeast of life even more tenuously scattered and utterly isolated within the same cosmos is the rarest of exceptions. It is only in view of the wisest use of time, spaces, occasions, opportunities, energies, and agencies that life has access to a future. Only within the guidelines of such wisdom can life, such an exception within the rule of an inanimate universe, hope for a future whose maximum radiance might still be the radiance of a minor sun of all possible suns of the spirit. Therefore, the physical sun, the true alpha god of dawn and symbol of the hypothesized spirit sun of a distant future, the omega god, is the reservoir of those energies that the life transformer is manipulating into the acentropic journey towards this other sun, the god of the spirit. On the other hand, the physical sun, which, when invested with divine power, becomes only the raw, brutish simulation of its own possible antelike, the other radiant sun, which is painstakingly originating itself from the father furnace. Since this is not a metaphor, but a hypothesis on its way to realization, and since it has been tested by more than 3,000 millions of years of history, to cling to a non-theological ecology would be a dispirited game. Setting the contemporary scene somewhat between the Alpha God, the Son, and the Crucible of Life, and the Omega God, Son of the Spirit, we are immensely closer to the crucible than to the omega god and must remind ourselves that of the whole diagram only the minute fraction which has transpired up to the present is more than a hypothesis we are presented with a paradoxical preposition of a theological simulation framed by the relatively fragile precedents of past history which say that god is this and that becomes secretive life might be that and the other at the same time it speaks of the urgency of knowing as comprehensively as we can what the hypothetical god needs to become if we concede that his making is conditioned to and in fact is our own making in the framework of matter becoming spirit, the pursuit of happiness is no more than a fringe benefit, an accident illuminating some substance of the process. Individual self-gratification is drowned in the onrush of the divine, whose radiance can only pause and illuminate that of the person who is intensely reverent and given donated as a component of the vector matter spirit. If this seems to be an indefinite postponement of fulfillment and an acceptance of existential hardship, it is not. On the contrary. It charges life with the responsibility of creating itself into the divine and can, as it should, fill the most humble effort with its singularity in which attainment above many more self-righteous things is the one made to glow by spiritual radiance. It points to the grace of theology, which is not the theology of sin, redemption, and longing for identification with the Alpha God. It is theology of creation whereby the hellish oneness of the original crucible is tamed and transfigured in the demonic divine intensity of the other sun, the sun of the sun, the omega sun of the spirit." That contemporary man might lack the strength to see beyond himself and thus for the sake of sanity might reject his metaphysical nature is possibly our single most tragic fault. If this is so, what remains to be contended with can only be handled in a pious or sanctimonious manner in which action is at best a retardant of catastrophe, the ultimate catastrophe of a killed future. The rhetoric of practical man in his spite for the intangible spirit is the incapacitating factor which makes reality rush by him unnoticed and unenjoyed. This makes him fail ultimately, as said before, even in his task as energizer of the secondary loop's practical maintenance continuity. If proof is needed, note the catastrophe of the automobile as an etherealization machine. The fact seems to be that the nuts and bolts of a practical man are to be stringently controlled, submitted to the priority of the spirit, the theoecology. Otherwise, they are nothing more than the sand of entropy and the cogs of a stir machine constructing itself into the omega god. 
What if all this trickles down to the average man, to underprivileged man, to elite man, to suffering humankind? The crushing responsibility of the godmakers. If the acceptance in principle of the theological simulation that sees fulfillment in God's speed is human, then arises the necessity of seeing as human not the shortcut, the way out, the self-righteous, the secure and comfortable, the ingrown, the expediency, the obsolescent, etc., but rather the conscious option towards reverence for life and the efforts it entails, and with it all the despairing ambiguities enveloping these efforts. It is because of the double difficulty of the demanding nature of humanness and its inherent ambiguities that when we are cl clear on something we should desperately be hopefully hold on to it. Rare are the moorings available to us in our construction of the future. The mooring of complexity, duration, and the miniaturization is clear and unequivocal, and as such is the most direct, promising, non-expedient launching platform toward an equity of social condition and a congruence with an ecological substructure. The two combine their creative best in the ecology of the civitis day, where the ecological gates will be kept open. Open also will remain the access to a more compassionate family of man, and finally open will be the gate to the progressive creation of the Omega God. The non-ultimate character of the Civitas Dei is in its being still only a simulation of its own entelechy, the aesthetogenesis of mass energy. To conclude, at the possible zenith of the materialistic age and in the wake of many pronouncements on the death of God, the theological question knocks ever more persistently at the door of man's consciousness and presses hard on his conscience. The pantheism of the aging flower children is far too innocent. Their recommendation of indiscriminate respect for all things touches on escapism, Love that is value-free rather than invaluable provides too, far too easy a bridge between narrow experience and the hypocritical irresponsibility. The scientific insight or the vacuum it created has displaced the hypothesis of an eternal God with a genesis of spirit which points towards the possibility dimly perceived of a future godliness. Premonitions of this direction are the sacramental strands which run perpetually along the fibers of life. That concludes The Theology of the Sun, part of Religion as Simulation. I'm continuing on to the next book of Religion as Simulation, called The Two Sons, Alpha and Omega God. The Two Sons, Alpha and Omega God. Synopsis. The pristine universe is made up of 10 to the 80 particle godlets. It is utterly polytheistic and therefore immensely weak, tenuously spirited. The final universe is God of total integrity and total consciousness. Logos will be. Logos will be all and everything, everywhere, for any and all times, because in that ultimate resurrectional condition, there will be no raw matter, but only pure spirit. Neither space, time, mass, nor energy will impede its being, since they will have been consumed in the process of creating it. Religion as Simulation, the, te the Theology of the Sun, the Technological Frankenstein. These papers are presented in the order in which they were written. More than chapters of a thinking process, they are the reiteration, elaboration, and modification of a central idea. God as a postulate of a possible or unavoidable future. And consequently, the presence in every moment of imminent particles of such God as they are produced by the Spirit. This paper is a synopsis of the theory, which is expanded in the other three papers. The paradoxical thesis presented here is that the physical universe is media patiently working at its own metamorphosis into message. McLuhan's language is used to propose the non-McLuhan view that the message is never the media. This is explained through the presentation of two extremes ad absurdum and one very important exception. The two extremes are alpha, an original condition in which the absence of any message leaves the whole of reality pure media. If one category, the message, is equal to zero, the total is equal to the other, the media. Within the, those confines, one could therefore say that the media is the message, a worthless immensity from the standpoint of teleology. Omega, a final condition of reality in which the message, by its own advent, has burned up the media in toto. Since this is the stage at which the media has finally been dissipated into the message, one can say that the media is the message, a teleological centration. Between these two extremes, one assumed to be the beginning and the other hypothesized to be the end, are instances unlimited in number and infinity in variety where media are the means by which the messages gather themselves. Since both media and message are constituents of the event, one is influential in the definition of the other, which is the element of truth in the McLuhan dictum. The exception is aesthetic reality, where media and message are bound together to a degree which yields one indivisible event. To isolate one is to destroy the whole and consequently the other. 
The morality play is media with a message, one distinguishable from the other. The tragedy is an indivisible and irreducible aesthetic event. To put it another way, the function of the bicycle is transportation. The function of a specific sonata is that the sonata, not the sonata form, which is the framework. Whatever other function we attach to it is a fringe benefit. The bicycle is an invention. The sonata is a creation. The bicycle is a means. The sonata is an end whose character partakes of the finality of the omega condition where the media is consumed into the message. Then, in the thesis of the universe as the medium metamorphosizing into the message, the lengthy process has an imminent percentage of realization. Consequently, every present, every moment of history carries within itself fragments of the message, the imminent realized part of it. This metamorphosis implies the activation of every speck of mass energy into a conscious, the conscious of itself as part of a whole, Eastern being, and the dynamic imperative such conscious produces, Western becoming. Within the activation inherent in each mass energy component of the force field is infused the new activity, the sensitization of consciousness. But consciousness is not yet the message. It is a preliminary quivering of matter, so to speak. The message is the further transformation of such consciousness into a new synthesis with the surroundings, a creation. One could call it the interiorization of the cosmos, which starts with the partial interiorizations of organic nature, the organisms, and surges in time into the associative, cooperative, cultural forms of society and beyond, involving larger and larger parts of the cosmos. Consciousness, the attribute of conscious, is then in a very primitive primeval way, or in a very sophisticated way, a cognitive category which acknowledges contiguous reality and acts accordingly, but whose ultimate concern is to transcend itself and otherness by an act of creation. As there is not such a thing as pure science, but instead a cognitive process called science, which seeks to understand a phenomenon and apply it to the formation of manipulative devices, Western, so there is not such a thing as pure consciousness, Eastern, but a perceptual cognitive process which, by the way of the brain's powers of generalization, tries to acquire, and does acquire, the ability to transubstantiate matter into sur matter. I will now restate the thesis. The physical world is the media, which I call the Alpha God, patiently working at his own metamorphosis into the message, which I call the Omega God. The term God is used for the concept because intrinsic to the word is the attribute of all-inclusiveness, the inclusiveness attempted by the preposition. One can expediently fill the gap between these two extreme gods by following this chart. The Omega God is the potential God. Omega God is the imminent God. The Gamma God is the simulation of God in man's image. The Beta God is the organic universe, and the Alpha God is the physical universe. The Alpha God and the Beta God are, respectively, the physical universe and the organic universe, pantheistic dynamism exclusive of man. The Gamma God is a symbol or simulation of what the human universe, inclusive of the preceding universes, ought to become. The Omega God exists in as much as it is realized in the imminent organic Omega God which is the human universe at present. Therefore, the Omega God is not a symbol as is the Gamma God, but a possibility attached to and conditioned by the actions of sentient life. 1. In ascending from Alpha to Omega, each God is supposative of the next. Each God fathers the next. 2. In descending from Omega to Alpha, each God is inclusive of the one preceding and carries its matrix. 3. In the absence of the next god, the son of god, the father god becomes the imminent god. For example, if the beta god of the organic universe is, but the sun god, the gamma god of simulation, is not yet asserted by human consciousness, then the beta god is the imminent god. 4. Before the appearance of the gamma god, the imminent god coincides with the total god. The reason that the gamma god does not coincide with the imminent god is because of the escape of self-consciousness from reality into constructed simulation of it. That is to say... The Gamma God works as an anticipatory power, with all the advantages and defects inherent of the intellectual abstractional processes. The simulation phase, the Gamma God, is unavoidable in the process of matter becoming spirit, since a. The stresses of life demand that it transact itself, b. An instantaneous and total transaction into spirit is impossible, c. The acquired technology of generalized structures in the thought process of the human mind favors simulation as an instrument for such processes, and d. Anguish it reveals itself at the core of self-consciousness, the anguish of being a fraction, the imminent Omega God of the Omega God, which might never come to be, begs for a structural guideline hypothesizing the possibility of such finality or entelechy, the form that actuates such realization. 
Therefore, it is necessary to have a substitute, the gamma god of simulation, who will support consciousness in the struggle and will comfort it in its most discouraged moments. Only after and beyond the alpha god is the imminent god, a fraction of the omega god. The theology proposed here is the theology of evolution, in contrast with the original Christian theology, which is a theology of salvation. The Catholic and Protestant, which is a theology of transformation, capitalism, and the Eastern theology, a theology of return or rediffusion. Granted that all this is oversimplified, all those theologies are unwillingly deterministic, since they substantially preclude the advent of a truly new, the uncreated, the omega and the omega god, the most deterministic theology, at least in words, the Marxist communistic theology, which wants the new man but through the reduction determinism of economics, politics, science. To conceive of more than one god is to open the door to all sorts of deities. But since the categorical imperative of the Omega God is utter centration, wherein all other gods are engulfed, it is only with its full advent that theology can rid itself of polytheism. For instance, the Beta God of the organic universe, fathered by the Alpha God of the physical universe, coexists with the Father God, but assuming the incipient advent of the Omega God, both Father Alpha and Son Beta are consumed in its radiance. The reason for this is in the nature of the Omega God, for whom all of reality has been made into conscious creation, the full sensitization of mass energy and the recreation of it into the Omega God. The further down and away we move from the Omega God, the more fractional divinity is. Indeed, in the physical world, the Alpha God is fractionalized among every particle of the cosmos, myriads of encapsulated gods, all prisoners to their own deterministic fate. But since they are so similar to each other, seen one, seen them all, the cosmos, as we perceive it now, is one step away from pure homogeneity and an ever-older Father God, the pure entropy God, the utter negation of any possible differentiation. The immense pull of such past, like an afterimage that does not fade, could be the explanation of the persistent and formidable trend of Alpha God towards a pure chaos of entropy, the sins of the fathers. Every time the door to the prison, where the fractional alpha gods are kept, is unlocked, each imprisoned alpha god particle takes cognition of its neighbors and may decide to enter into an association with one or more of them. This is the organic advent. One could hypothesize that the interaction which existed before such a decision was an interaction forced upon each particle by an exterior power, gravitational, atomic, magnetic, etc., or which amounts to the same by a power which was and is most fatally determined, determinally nil, and tropically single-minded, the real Antichrist fate. The organic event is the first synthesis of the beta god from two or more elementary particles of the alpha god. In what might appear as a paradox, taking into consideration the full evolutionary process, we move from no divinity and total segregation, the one per particle alpha god, ignorant of everything and each identical to the unknown neighbor, to maximum diversification and total desegregation, and finally, the ultimate synthesis, the omega god, from ignorance to comprehension, from complexity to simplicity, from analysis to synthesis, from indifference to radiance, from randomness to oneness. At the alpha god level, the effect is readable in the cause, and transcendence is only a distant and remote hypothesis, proposed by no one because no one is there to do so. Self itself is not conceived nor conceivable yet. As soon as the deterministic prison doors are ajar, transcendence moves on to the stage of reality and creation becomes operative. As of now, in the cosmos we know, transcendence is still primitive, and it has been organically operative for 3,500 millions of years, give or take a few eons. If man is taken as the paragon, this itself gives scale and dynamism to the phenomenon. Thus, if one side we can feel the immense smallness of the Omega God as measured by the amount of it, him, imminent in life, the Omega God, on the other side we cannot ignore, even if we want to, the formidable thrust of this hypothesis literally sweeping us from our feet while unlocking matter to wrestle with it, the Omega component of the Gamma hypothesis. Stone, the petrified hypothesis of the spirit, ultimately needs to the hammering of the compassion component, a conscience, to deliver itself to the building crew, the organic mental, to express its own limited self in the parts not yet appropriated, i.e. interiorize, and to the total self of the Omega God. We are not building in the image of God since that is idolatry, the adoration of Alpha God. We create God or we fail to do so. There is no third alternative, since a third alternative is a diminution, to say the least, a negation, really, of the Omega God. Translated into contemporary terms and viewed from the perspective of the eye of the spirit, the most comprehensive definition of pollution is the segregational mode of mass energy, that is to say, the Alpha God, or better yet, its father, seen as a situation of origin. 
The original pool is segregative, polluted and entropic, the antithesis of the godfather of traditional theology. If this condition were to be the result of a breakdown of the highest synthesis, then it would become an evil working against the zenith of diversification and the oneness of the Omega God. The Church, in its contention that a fully achieved God exists, has to accept the dialectic of an all-powerful, all-knowing God confronted by an exterior thing upon which his love has no power of redemption and a weak power of persuasion. No power of redemption since the fall from grace by the thing implies faulty omniscience or omnipresence to start with. Only by clearly admitting this original faulty condition in the nature of the Alpha God can one really make head or tail of the fall from grace. That is to say, the understanding is reached that what is in the Alpha God and Beta God is the only first step of numberless steps to come, moving towards the true omniscience omnipresence of the barely conceivable Omega God. The power of persuasion is weak, since the state of contention is that of an existing perfection axiomatically non-perfectible, and therefore the direct consequence is that the less-than-perfect thing, life, must be outside such perfection and is only incidental, ephemeral, and fraudulent. Then the motives for persuasion become reasons for frustration, if not downright damnation, since they are working on the fragile scaffoldings of joy and sufferance which are illusory. The consequence is life as a doomed and inescapable spin-off of divinity, the Greek fate, or quite the opposite, life seen as the eye of the storm making matter into spirit. For the first condition, life seems like one of the first steps down toward the pollution of pervasive entropy, supervised by an impotent god. For the second condition, life is one of the first steps up towards the asentropy of divinity. To reaffirm the wholeness of the temporal, spatial, energetic, conscious universe and the perceptible and strong thrust that seems to indicate an irresistible, if not automatic, irreversibility of the vector, matter-spirit, and the direction of the last, one can consider the solar system as typical of situations where such irreversibly affirms itself, and where the sun, case by case, is the original, if local, alpha god, and the spirit developing from it as the sun's offspring is an omega god, that with all the other omega gods developing around the other suns throughout the universe sums up the imminence of the omega god. This theology does not intend to be a metaphor, but rather a true or false situation, a barely structured representation of what we can recall reality. To verify it means to realize it, since the proof of its veracity cannot be found in simulation. It is, in fact, this impossibility which makes the god of the church into the gamma god, the simulation god. This is the equivalent of saying that ultimately the mystery of reality is one with reality itself and the resolution of it, Mystery and reality will have to wait for the most remote of all futures to explain itself to itself. This is the tautological condition in which creation finds itself. Creation is self-explanatory. Its advent is the, the reason for its advent. In any other light, creation is not creation but development. Therefore, the mystery is the creation. The chain of events of every successive link is supported and instrumentalized by, but not traceable to, the preceding. Creation is a folly with secretive intent, part of which is to further another folly with secretive intent. The folly with the secretive intent of the solar system has been to gravitate the surface of space with bundles of mass energy in a gravitational electromagnetic net of the planets. By successive chains of follies with secretive intents, one of these bundles, the Earth, through the alchemy of the whole system, has come up with more and more pollutants of terseness, stone from naught, life from stone, alpha god and the unnameable beta god from alpha god, and so on. The position of the Gamma God is critical because it partakes both of falseness and trueness. Only by renouncing the illusion of gazing at the real can the believer find the true sense of its simulated God and trust in the possibility of its advent through faith and deeds. That is to say, as soon as I know that the Gamma God is the false God, I come to know that it stands for a remotely possible true God, an ultimate folly with secret intent. Therefore, the God of traditional religion is a false God and at the same time a necessary guide toward an utterly remote and improbable true God, the sun, the earth, the leaf, the virus, man. This chain of ancestry cornering a speck in ongoing surging space-time and imbuing such speck with a feasible sound of life is the barely conceivable hypothesis of an immense metamorphosis of matter into spirit. Put into the context of man, the hypersensitized part of the imminent Omega God of today, it appears that the city is at the center of the storm, where, to be repetitive, the hypothetical eye is the Omega God. This is so for the elemental fundamental reason that the city stands as one of the links, and today as the link, 
in the chain of intensification synthesis or metamorphosis that sees the alpha god giving way to the approximation of its own entelechy, the omega god. The good city is the center of intense processes where awareness is fed by the abundance of environmental information characteristic of the performing city, supplemented by the more specialized but remote audiovisual printed and electronic information, and where optimally such information awareness is transformed into knowledge wisdom, the attributes of godliness. The good city becomes the city of God when such knowledge is put to use, and the ensuing condition is the transcendence into creation, the central attribute of God, the Omega God. The two suns, the Alpha God of pure matter and the Omega God of pure spirit, once concrete, the other hypothetical, separated by the immense time gap of all futures and linked by infinitesimal moments of consciousness, past and present, are not in contraposition to one another. Indeed, since one is the necessary premise for the other, they form an indivisible becoming of media into the message. Now, Thus concludes the section of religion as stimulation called the two sons, Alpha and Omega God. Thus also completes section 4-5 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Tomorrow I will continue with section 4-6, Revelation, Invention, Creation. I will see you then. Alam. <laughs>